let's uh, turn again to Romans chapter 13 and the fourth verse of the chapter Romans 13 verse 4 but is God's servant to do you good Now, it's often said that the church should take uh, nothing to do with politics, that that whole sphere is uh, worldly, that that whole sphere is one best left to the men of this world itself, and that Christians individually, the church collectively, or to stand back from embroilment in this particular sphere. Now I find that impossible for several reasons. It's impossible first of all because the word of God itself has so much to say on politics. We find that many of the standing figures for themselves politicians, men like Moses and David and Solomon and Daniel were very fully involved in that sphere in their own day. And in the course of describing the lives, the Bible brings out very often the fundamental principles of political application. And the Bible also, as in this passage before us, looks those issues squarely in the face. It lays down elusive, categorical, specific teaching with regard to this whole sphere. It tells us what government is, defines its obligations, defines its rights, defines our attitude towards it. We can't say that those passages are to be found in the Word of God. They stand there before us. The Lord himself, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, John in the Revelation, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, all these raise political questions. And we can't simply ignore this great body of material. And then again, there is this. There is the fact that many of God's children exercise political responsibility and they need guidance as to how to bear that responsibility. I think of those believers involved in local government, of those involved in national government, of those involved in international government. These men and women bear heavy responsibilities. They ask God's church for guidance, for encouragement, for the ground rules pertinent to this whole sphere. And the church cannot say, we've no interest in that sphere. It can't even say, we don't know. The church must afford guidance to those brothers and sisters called into this particular area. But of course, also in a democracy, all of us have political power. All of us are enfranchised. All of us have access to the political process. All of us can influence public opinion. All of us have some say in the government of our own nation. And that means 
that we too need guidance. We need information. We need to ask, what does God's word say? as to the principles, priorities, axioms relevant to this whole sphere. Has God foreseen this situation in which we enjoy as individuals such authority? And has God given us guidance relevant to those responsibilities? Well, my answer is, that he has. And so therefore, I turn to this passage in the light of the fact that soon we exercise the franchise and at the same time wanting to declare my own position, that I have no affiliation to any party, that I vote for no party consistently, that I would find it difficult, in fact, to hold to any single party allegiance. And the word I want to speak is a word which seeks only to do justice to the passage before me. That does not mean that my words, therefore, reflect no bias. It is impossible, I think, to speak without bias. I try to allow for bias, and yet that bias will perhaps inevitably come through. There are two questions to ask. First of all, what is the nature of the state? And secondly, what are our obligations to it? First of all, the nature of the state. Well, in this passage, that's summed up in one word. The state is a servant. He is God's servant, verse 4. And again, the same sentiments in verse 6. The authorities are God's servants. Now, in some ways, that's a remarkable thing. Because the state often sees itself in terms of lordship. The state often imagines that individuals exist for it and not it for the state. Louis XIV of France said once, I am the state. The state is me. The state exists for me. And when Paul wrote this epistle, the state was on the threshold of making the same claim, the threshold of absolute right, absolute dominion, absolute sovereignty over the life and death and property of every single individual. The state is by nature tempted to self-aggrandisement towards absolutizing its own claims, towards seeing itself as the ultimate and non-responsible authority. And then Paul says, no, the state is servant. The state is not Lord. The state is not absolute or ultimate. It's not unlimited. It's not non-responsible or unaccountable. But the state exists to serve. And that maybe is the single most important word spoken in this whole passage. The state is a diaconate. A diaconate that waits on the citizen. The state is God's servant to enact the will of God. The state is fundamentally service. And that service, as I've hinted, looks in two directions. First of all, the state 
is the servant of God. That is so plain in verse 4. For he is God's deacon. And again in verse 6, the authorities are God's, I think by tour guy, God's officials. They're not self-serving, but they are God's servants. In other words, all authority is derived from God. The state has no inherent authority. It is only a delegated authority. In its authority, it is always dependent on God, always answerable to God, always bound to stop and say, I have no authority to do this. God has not given me this mandate. My power does not extend to that area. The state enjoy a limited authority delegated by God. In other words, the state must enact only God's laws. Just as in the church, those who lead the church have no right to invent laws. We have no right to say to somebody, for example, thou shalt not go to a football match. Thou shalt not go to a disco. Because the source of our authority has not given us that authority. In the same way, the state cannot invent laws. It cannot say this would be popular. It can't say this would be useful. It can't say this appeals to us as a parliament. It must always ask itself, has the authority given us authority to enact this law? And in the same way, the state has authority only to enact God's sanctions. It is a solemn business, this problem of the treatment of offenders, as it's called. Men have no right to elaborate and weave out of their own imaginations penal systems which they think might be right. They have to look for guidance to God's word and the principles of equity and the laws of nature and ask, well, what does God say is the correct punishment for this particular offense? And sometimes we assume too cavalierly that it's up to ourselves to devise popular punishments or the most terrifying concept of all, the deterrent sentence the exemplary sentence which uses one poor human being to discourage the others. We have no right to behave in that way because God says, let the laws be equitable and let the punishment be equitable and it be proportionate to the offense. God doesn't insist or allow that the punishment be popular. God doesn't allow that it be a deterrent, that that be the main concern, but God wants it to be equitable and in that sense to be retributive. So he is God's servant, this power, to enact God's laws, to enact God's sanctions, and also, of course, to raise God's taxes. You have there, you see, in verse 6. This is why you pay taxes for the authorities of God's servants to give their full time to governing. God is his own servants who raise revenue for the purposes of divinely ordained government. Now they raise revenue, of course, again, in accordance 
with God's own rules, God's laws of equity, and for purposes that God himself sanctions, the state has no right to raise penal levels of taxation or to deploy the revenue for the purposes of its own self-aggrandizement or for the self-indulgence of the rulers or for the protection of power blocks within society but it raises revenue as the servant of God at all those points this is so hugely important. The state a servant, the state enacting that for God's laws, enacting God's sanctions and raising God's revenues. And it was for this that our forefathers were so terrified of what they called the atheistic state. This specter haunted the men of the 17th and 19th centuries. This terrible idea of a government which acknowledged no God, which had no fear of God, which lacked that for the rudiments and the foundations of wisdom, which was so strongly tempted to see itself as God, because to the non-theist there is no greater authority than the state itself. There is no higher tribunal than Parliament. There is none of that humility born of the knowledge that one day the politician will himself stand before the throne of God. The Caesars, the Neros, the Caligulas, the Napoleons, the Hitlers, the Stalin, the Josescus of this world, the knowledge that one day they shall stand before God. That was the knowledge that these men lacked. And our democracy is on the threshold of an age of great peril. When it is said for the first time in its history, no major party leader is prepared to affirm even a theoretical belief in the doctrines of Christianity. And it's against that background that one is asking, how then will the godless state men Without the fear of God, how will they serve God? And right there, the peril of the state, making absolute and unqualified claims. But then, too, the state is a servant of man. He is God's servant to do you good. The government doesn't exist for the benefit of its own members or the benefit of its own parties. It exists for the benefit of the governed, for the benefit of the ruled, and for the benefit of the entire community. And of course that means an impartial commitment to every single group within society across all the divisions of faith and religion, across all the barriers of class, across all ethnic divisions, the state must rule even-handedly. And it is important that we Christians should not lose our nerve here, and should not seek to defend ourselves and our faith, by asking for partial treatment because we too must know that this state exists for the good of the whole community 
of every single group within society. And yet one must also say that there is room for bias and there is room for prejudice within the state. And I say it unashamedly. There is room for bias in favour of the poor. However one defines poverty, those with no access to the media, those with no access to power, those with no access to employment, with no access to jobs, those who have no security, those who have no power, those who have no voice, those who are impotent and those who are speechless. It is they in particular who need the protection of the state. The Bible has an enormous interest in the poor. The theologians might recall that in Kittel's Dictionary there are in fact 30 double-columned pages on the word poor in the New Testament because the poor are such an important category. The people's poor one see shall judge, said Psalm 72. He shall defend the children of the needy. Oh, it is a huge problem, this. Because many people argue for minimal government. They argue for laissez-faire, for let things alone. For non-intervention in economic and in social policy. And they imagine that events left to themselves will ensure a modicum of prosperity for every branch within society. And men like Thomas Chalmers said, leave it to the law of charity. Leave it to relatives. Leave it to neighbors. Leave it to friends and they will look after the poor. But is it so? Is there not a need for the charity of law as well as for the law of charity? And is it not a foremost claim as we approach an election a foremost claim on every Christian conscience that the first question we ask of every single party and of every single policy, how will this impact the poor? What will it do for the unemployed? What will it do for the sick? What will it do for those in prison? What will it do for the elderly? What will it do for the weak? Well, I'm not saying to you which policy or which party is most likely to meet the needs of this group in our community. But I'm saying that these poor matter to God as does no other section in our community. And I'm saying that the great, great question we must always ask of government is this, and of all those parties, not how does this impact those who pay taxes, but how does it impact those who do not pay taxes, the people's poor ones, he shall judge. The pillar apostles said to the apostle, Paul, remember the poor, the very which thing, Paul says, 
I was eager to do. Now every party, every party says its policies are good for the poor. That to me is the single greatest question in any election. The poor in Britain, the poor in the third world, how will these policies impact those who cannot speak for themselves, who have no power, who have no job prospects? What will your policies do for these people? He is God's servant to do you good. God's servant to do good for the poor, to protect the poor from the forces of greed, the forces of inhumanity and exploitation. That is the state's primary function, to protect the defenseless, to protect the weak and the infirm. And there is a third thing, and it's this. In a way, it's supplementary. The state is a form of violence. The state as God's servant, the state as man's servant, and the state as a form of violence, bearing, you see, the sword. In many ways, this is a terrible fact, a fact that will not be very evident in the election campaigns, and yet that's what we are electing men to whom we shall entrust the sword, in whom we shall invest authority over immeasurable weapons of violence. The state has the power to arrest, the power to imprison, it had the power under the Roman Empire to flog and to crucify. It has still a power of the truncheon. And I do think that makes it so important that the state should know that it is a servant of God. What will the state do with its violence? We have seen in our century the violence of Nazi Germany, the violence of Stalin, the violence of Ceausescu, the violence of Argentina and its hundreds of thousands of lost ones. We have seen the violence in this land itself of what men euphemistically call unsafe convictions. We must exercise the utmost vigilance. We must tremble as we invest men and women who have no fear of God with those powers of arrest and those powers of imprisonment, and those powers to wage war in our name, to deploy nuclear weapons in our name. That will be the great hidden fact and undisclosed fact and unmentioned fact in the whole of the campaign. And yet you must always ask, will I trust this man and this woman with a sword? The state as God's servant, the state as man's servant, the state as a form of violence. And what then are our obligations to the state? I mean, biblically, whatever party may happen to be in power. 
let me itemize those principles rapidly. First of all, we are to pray for those in power. The early church found this difficult. It was so distant from those in authority. And very often, of course, it was uh, so persecuted by those in authority. And yet, God wants us to pray for them. It is so easy, you know. In the idiom of political debate and discussion in our own civilization, it's simply to lampoon them, to ridicule, pour scorn on them. But they do bear horrendous burdens, and they face many insoluble problems, the physical demands, the emotional demands, the constant burdens of office, the unrelenting barrage of criticism, the prevailing sense of insecurity, the knowledge that democracy is an ungrateful employer. Those factors are always there. And we do need to ask God so to uphold them and so to bless them and so to guide them that indeed they transcend themselves and to pray that God would grant them a wisdom far above what is natural, that they may know the way through the appalling morass of problems which tonight confront our own uh, civilization. It is God's specific directive. Pray for all who are in authority. And then again, God wants you to submit to them. Of course, that submission is not unqualified. The state, as we saw, is itself to subordinate itself to the interests of those whom it serves. The state, too, puts the good of the individual before its own good, before the good of the government. In that way, the state submits. And of course, there are situations when the government commands what God forbids and forbids what God commands. Do you know that in the city of Glasgow, it is illegal to preach the gospel in the open air? That act is one which the whole church of God or to disregard. It is a contravention of God's own law. The state has no right to forbid what God commands. And when the state does it, then the believer is not bound by any such law. I will not do what God forbids. And I shall not refrain from what God commands. But when the state's directives are biblical, when the state's directives are in accordance with God's laws, are motivated by concern for the community, are not uh, ultra viris, are not in contravention of equity of the laws of nature, then I am bound to obey. I am bound to obey, even when I think the law may be wrong, may be inexpedient, may be impolitic, may be nonsensical. It may be bad law, but I am still bound to obey because the power is ordained by God. Just as within the church, if I may say so, those who lead the church have a right to expect obedience, an obedience that does not always depend on the people's conviction that the decision is a wise decision. We are to obey the powers that be, except when they forbid what God commands or command what God forbids. 
So we pray and we submit. Now this submission causes me huge difficulty and embarrassment as you see. But it is still there as a principle. I do not believe that there is a principle that we must as believers blindly follow that we must always obey the law. Sometimes we should not obey the law. And sometimes I would say in God's name, do not obey that law. And so the general principle, which is so often proclaimed from Westminster, that we, the law must be obeyed, is one which I see as itself a manifestation of the tendency on the part of the state to divinize and magnify itself. Because the day may come when that state erects some law, which is indeed parliamentary law, and has the Queen's seal, and yet is most emphatically not to be obeyed. But the general principle is that we must submit to those authorities. And then thirdly this, we are to pay taxes, we are to pray, we are to submit, and we are to pay taxes. Now it is a very serious business if uh, those who are Christians uh, evade the responsibility in this area because we expect the state to provide services uh, to do that the state needs resources therefore tribute and taxes now sometimes those taxes are ill-considered. Sometimes they are less equitable than we ourselves might wish. But to that fact does not by itself warrant our non-compliance with such laws and such regulations because the state has the power under God to raise those taxes. The state must raise tribute. And hence, the word says to us that they are God's servants for the raising of revenue. Now I know in every congregation in this land there are those who have not paid their poll taxes, who are hugely angered by that poll tax. That tax may be an unfair tax. It is not an ungodly tax. It would be ungodly if the revenue for it were misapplied, if the revenue from it were deployed for ungodly purposes, to provide luxuries for those in power, or to promote injustice or self-aggrandizement. But I plead with you that this is an elementary Christian duty. I plead with you that it is a very bad Christian witness that we withhold from the state what is its due. And the consequence is, of course, that there is a sad decline in the quality of services, and even more, there is a grossly unfair burden on those who do pay. Now, those of you who are proud of your own free church heritage might well go back to Thomas Chalmers' exposition of Romans and look at chapter 13. And uh, there Chalmers challenged the preachers of the gospel to preach on this particular theme. Because in his day, 
tax evasion was as prevalent as it is in our day. And Christians boasted then as they do now of their cleverness in this area. Now, in my own judgment, such evasion is simply immoral. It is immoral because we still expect the services. And it's immoral because others must pay ever so much more because we abdicate in this particular area. And let me just add two more points quickly. The first is this, that we exercise our own political power responsibly. We exercise our own political power responsibly. Now I've said we have power. We have the right to vote. We vote responsibly. That involves that we inform ourselves as well as we can on the claims and policies of the respective candidates, that we have some clear understanding of what the Bible's political priorities actually are. And beyond the election, we still have power, the power to criticize unjust policies, the power to encourage just policies, all these constitute power. There are far more evangelicals in Britain than there are Marxists. And yet for so long, I think it's less true now, but for so long, that Marxist voice had influence far beyond the voice of the Christians because the Christians would not face the demands and the cost of meaningful and painful political involvement. You see, you cannot choose to have the power. God has given you the power. God has given you responsibility for this society. As I look the Western Isles and their problems, everyone, administrators, councillors, members of the community, all saying they're to blame, they're to blame, they're to blame. If in this land of ours tonight we face a future in which revenue is raised by means of a lottery, if the exchequer itself is to be maintained on the basis of greed, the worship of gems. You ask me, who is to blame? You ask me, do I think they're to blame? They're to blame? Them out there, they're to blame? Do I think they're to blame? I think we're to blame. I think you're to blame. I think I'm to blame. Each one of us bears responsibility for the death.